All righty, everyone. Welcome back. A uh, quick friendly reminder, we're going to open up for a live Q&A at the end of the session, so please submit your questions for our panelists at the bottom of your screen using the Q&A function. We hope the information provided by our experts so far is timely and valuable, and we look forward to staying in touch as your company continues to grow. If you're interested in booking a meeting with our partners, please use the link in the chat. As you settle in, we're going to take a quick poll to understand where you are as far as what you're looking to learn in this next session. So I'm going to launch this poll. Appreciate you guys sharing some of your feedback. But how many acquisitions are you planning in the next few months? 2021 has been very active. So let our panelists know where you're thinking. Um, so I'm going to give this another second or so. Really appreciate you guys sharing. We're gonna get started in just a moment. All right, I'm gonna show these results. So many of you say zero, but uh, the others say one to three, three to five or five to 10. So looks like a lot of you are thinking about it or considering it in the coming months. Now, without any further delay, please give me, please join me in giving a warm welcome in the chat to our special guests for the buy side panel. Our moderator, Siran, she's the VP of Corporate Development at Viacom CBS. We also have John, who's a Managing Director at KPMG, Melissa, who's a member at Wilson Sonsini, and Yelena, Vice President of Transactional Insurance, M&A, and IPO Risk at Woodruff Sawyer. And for those of you who are joining us, who joined us last year, this is the same team that we had on this last panel. So I'm looking forward to learning if anything has changed, and I'm sure it has, on the M&A buy side. Saran, Melissa, John, over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. And good out morning slash afternoon, everyone. I'm very exciting, excited to be uh, moderating this panel uh, this, uh, today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Saran Snillian um, at Viacom CBS. Um, uh, where I currently oversee M&A and investment activity across the company. Um, I was previously at UBS Investment Bank, so I've spent a number of years both advising buyers and being a buyer um, in M&A. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to John. Yeah, hi, I'm John Milner, and I'm a managing director in KPMG's deal advisory practice, and I help advise my clients throughout a M&A life cycle. Um, really executing on the transaction. A lot of that's in the pre-signing phase, including diligence. And a lot of that is also in the post-close, helping execute on that value creation thesis and all the reasons why you're doing an M&A transaction. And my practice is around both supporting private equity clients and corporates. And a lot of that's in growth equity. So thinking about how startups are funding themselves in some of the later stages. Excited to be on this panel once again. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa Hollitz. I'll jump in and go next. Um, I'm a partner at Wilson Sonsini. I um, have a fairly broad corporate practice, but um, my sweet spot is really representation of serial acquirers um, with some additional representation on sell side and um, other types of acquirers as well. Happy to be here. And hi, everyone. I'll round, the, round this out. My name is Yelena Donayevsky. I'm a vice president of transactional insurance here at Woodruff Sawyer. And my practice focuses uh, primarily on M&A activity uh, and helping private equity and strategic buyers with their M&A transactions. And I also do a lot of work uh, with SPACs. Um, I was previously practicing corporate finance and securities lawyer. And so my experience in that area helps me um, advise my current clients as an insurance broker and uh, lead them towards a, a good solutions for managing the risk on the M&A side. And I'm very happy to rejoin the team and, and see everyone again and uh, uh, share some insights uh, that I've seen um, of, in the market over the last six months. Happy to be here, thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, well, a wonderful uh, welcome everyone. Um, and let's dig right in. Um, uh, you know, we were, we, it was, it has been about six months since we all uh, sat down together virtually um, in this forum uh, to chat about m and um, You know, get, taking that into account, kind of how, how have you seen um, uh, M&A change from a, from a buy side perspective over those last six months? And I think this is really one for the group. So maybe John, I'll, I'll start with you. Yes. 
while nothing seems to have changed in you know my personal circumstance, I'm still sitting in my home office, and so it seems, feels like nothing has changed. In the deal market, it seems like everything has changed. I feel like deals continue to move faster. Um, there's a lot more competition, which is somewhat unexpected given kind of the conditions that we've seen over the last six months. So I think it's a very favorable market for sellers to be in, which puts buyers in a very interesting position and requires a lot of kind of due diligence and thought around what you're doing. Um, so again, I'm just seeing deals move faster, more competition, and a little bit more, you know, pricing is a little bit higher is, I guess, how I'll end it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Melissa, what about you? What have you been noticing in the last two quarters? There's obviously the rise of the SPAC that, you know, we've talked about earlier in earlier panels, and we'll talk about more on this panel. Um, and I would echo what John said, which is that this feels very much like six months ago, except on fast forward. Um, mm -hmm. the, the pace is just... <laughs> remarkable. Um, <laughs> um, and I, you know, we're all still sitting in our homes, but I think we're all sitting in our homes uh, working frantically and the market is just, um, uh, it's fast <laughs> and it's furious right now. Certainly very much consistent feedback so far. Uh, Yelena, is that, is that uh, also the same on your side? I would agree with that. And I think that Melissa is, is being uh, very polite and putting it lightly, but I think everyone's kind of tearing their hair out, at least all of the lawyers <laughs> and brokers and underwriters that I speak to. Um, in December, the activity went through the roof and I think it really hasn't stopped. So from where I'm sitting, the market's just been on steroids over the last few months and I'm not seeing any sort of let up uh, in the activity in, in the future. So that's sort of what I've been seeing in terms of changes. In terms of what's kind of not really changed, I'm still seeing a lot of competition from the insurers in the market. There are still over 20 insurers that are willing to uh, write reps and warranties risk. Um, there has been one exit and two new insurers came in and we're likely to see additional ones joining in, 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 the, in the market, mostly due to the fact that there's just so much, much activity and a lot of room for additional deals. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So uh, I guess, Melissa, you, you made reference to SPACs and, and obviously a, a hot topic. Um, I think we've all seen fairly exponential growth in that market um, over the last year and certainly expedited over the last uh, two quarters. Um, I think in Q1 alone, there was uh, 300 uh, IPOs or thereabouts and close to 100 M&A transactions by SPACs. Um, so in that context, um, you know, could you give us a little bit more color to how you're seeing SPACs impact the, uh, the M&A market and specifically from the acquirer standpoint? Sure. Yeah, no, I think there's several ways that it's impacted the market. I mean, first, and, and you already touched on this, but there's competition, right? There's hundreds of SPACs out there that are funded that need to find a target. Um, and so they're out, you know, looking for who they're going to buy. Um, and so I think, you know, serial acquirers are having to compete with, you know, more potential exits. I think they've changed the market a little bit and that the, the terms for a typical SPAC deal are a little bit different from what you'd normally see from another, you know, another type of acquirer. And so that's pushed the market a little more towards you know, less protection on indemnities, more of like a public public type transaction. Um, and then honestly, there's just a lack of resources. Like they have sucked up an enormous amount of resources in the system. Um, and so I think just trying to find the bandwidth of all of your advisors to get to do your normal transactions is, is quite frankly harder. I mean, we're all doing the best we can. Um, and, you know, Yelena said it, like we're all struggling a little bit right now. And so I think they've, I think they've just put a lot of pressure on a system that has always that has always been quick moving, <laughs> and it's just starting to move faster. Um, very interesting. And I guess John, from from your perspective, um, you know how 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 have you seen that dynamic play out from from your purview? Yeah, well, I think Melissa just kind of alluded to it in terms of SPAC sucking up a lot of bandwidth in the system. I mean, I think that competition coupled with the existing competition from private equity buyers, from corporate buyers, there's just, there's no slack in the system right now. And, you know, we've seen incredible levels of deal activity from all, all sorts of buyers right now and sellers bringing kind of everything to the market. Um, 
you know, there, there just really isn't a lot of bandwidth. And I, it's putting a lot of pressure on the system in every place, whether it be accountants, um, other advisors, attorneys, the insurance market. You know, so I think what we're seeing is actually really turning away a lot of work because we just don't have the bandwidth to do it ourselves. And I'm hearing that across, you know, the board from our competitors, from the partners that we work with. I think one of the interesting dynamics that's falling out of that is that my clients on the buy side are using that to push back against sellers with aggressive timelines that are coming to market that are saying, look, I know you want to sell this, this asset. It may be competitive. It may be really interesting. You may have a lot of demand, but nobody can actually execute a transaction in the time frame that you're using. And so you're using it to provide a little bit of pushback to the competition that's, um, out there in the market right now. So I think as a buyer, you know, that can work to your advantage a little bit. Um, obviously, if you're not, if you can't get any sort of advising help, you know, you got to get that help. But, um, you know, sometimes it can be helpful in a really aggressive process. Got it, got it. Um, and, and similar, Yolanda, I think from, from your perspective, um, how has that sort of uh, dynamic carried over on the rep and warranty insurance side? Yeah, so it's interesting and again, similar to what John and Melissa are saying, I've actually had uh, a couple of times where uh, folks looking for, for uh, attorneys or auditors have come to me asking for help <laughs> to put in a good word <laughs> into some of my contacts so that they can actually, uh, you know, so that the, those folks would pick up the phone. It, it seems like it, it's it's almost impossible to, to get good help out there, um, which, which is sad, which is sad considering the number of lawyers <laughs> that are out there. Um, but in terms of reps and warranties, what I've been seeing a lot in the market because of this increased activity is the insurers are, are overwhelmed. And so there's been pushback um, in terms of bandwidth on the, their side as well. The underwriters are just overwhelmed and um, some are not even willing to look at submissions. Um, some are really pushing back on some of the submissions, especially the smaller deals have kind of uh, taken the brunt of, of this uh, a work environment where, where there are a lot more larger deals in the market. And so the insurers are, you know, looking uh, to work on the larger deals and kind of pushing aside the smaller deals. So the, the, the ones under 50 million perhaps in, in purchase price or with, you know, looking for limits of 5 million or less are not really getting the attention that they used to. Um, uh, so that's, kind of what's driving the market. On the positive side, I think everyone's sort of recovered uh, post COVID and they're not as nervous about uh, how to deal with the COVID situation as they used to be a few months ago. I mean, obviously there's still, insurers are still putting in exclusions relating to COVID um, and they're still uh, kind of across the board excluding you know, PPP loans and things like that. Um, but they are overall more willing to write to the risk and look at the risk specifically. Um, so that's sort of a positive. And then of course, SPACs, you know, that's, <laughs> that is something that's been developing in the market. That bandwidth kind of eats into uh, the insurer's ability to um, uh, get up to speed on SPACs. I, a lot of them, a lot more of them now are are more um, knowledgeable around how SPACs should be treated and how they should be looked at. Definitely a lot more than six months ago. They have better uh, knowledge sort of institutionally. Uh, but again, there's just bandwidth from all sorts of deals coming at them from private equity space, from strategic mm -hmm. space, and now from the SPAC space. So sometimes the SPACs kind of get pushed aside a little bit. Interesting. So you, you touched on um, the bandwidth constraints and how they're having an impact um, in terms of sidelining potentially the smaller deals. Um, John and Melissa, from a, the perspective of financial and legal advisors, would you say that the current um, uh, level of activity uh, here has uh, favored perhaps larger deals from your purview as well or deals that are being um, driven by serial acquirers or any other sort of dynamic that, it, that is getting favored versus, versus other deals? You know, we all hate to turn away work, but the reality is that we are starting to turn away work. So I, I will say, I think to the, 
I don't know that it's necessarily, it, it's not quite so black and white as sort of a preference for larger deals over smaller deals, but I will say it is relationship driven. So, you know, people are calling Elena to get a good word in with the attorneys. And when we are trying to choose between deals, I will say a client who's been around for years and years will get a little more bandwidth than somebody who's new that we don't know anything about. Um, and, and, and sure, like, a, you know, a large transaction always gets a little, you know, they, they tend to shove their way a little ahead in the pipeline. So I, you know, I, I think it's a delicate balancing act. And I think there's a bunch of factors, but um, th this isn't, this is a good time to be a loyal client with a tight relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> yeah, I would echo everything you just said, Melissa. It's a good time to have a very good relationship. And I, I think it's one reason why you know, a lot of serial acquirers use the same folks time in and time in, even when you know they're not doing a lot of deals or they don't have them on the horizon. It, it's about keeping those relationships warm and being ready um, because deals do happen really fast. All right. All right. Um, so yeah, Melissa, I've been turning back to you. Um, you touched briefly on this um, in your in your earlier comments, just around the, the role of SPACs and how they're changing somewhat what you are seeing in, in agreements. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more in terms of how you are seeing the legal side of um, transactions kind of evolving last uh, few quarters? Any any moves in terms of certain provisions that you have to have or you don't have? Um, any any dynamics around kind of the approach on antitrust? Anything along those lines? Sure. Yeah. No, I think in the same way that when PE started to play more aggressively in m and serial acquirers had to think about rep and warranty insurance in a way that they didn't have to originally. Now SPACs are moving the needle even further into, as I said, they tend to do sort of public company deals where reps don't survive and there's not an indemnity. And so to the extent that you're a serial acquirer and you are now competing with a SPAC, I think you have to be prepared to understand what what is the, you know, what, what is the, the spiel of the SPAC and can you go in there and compete with that? And, and they're competing on different fields and, and they tend to, um, they tend to appeal to slightly different targets, but I do think serial acquirer and, and PE for that matter, all the acquirers are having to be a little bit more creative in terms of what the offering is. And if they're competing for, you know, for a highly valued asset, they're going to have to step outside their comfort zone a little bit. Um, and then you talked about antitrust and yeah, that one has been, um, uh, in, incre that, that should increasingly be moving up on people's radars. Mm -hmm. um, there are a bunch of, you know, the, the regulatory agencies are, are frankly increasingly hostile towards big tech and it's showing. There's a bunch of large, you know, high profile cases out there. Um, and the FTC has, you know, they have a fair amount of turnover. The people who are coming in are, um, enforcement minded and there are some you know there's some pieces of legislation out there that would shift the burden of proof that would make it easier to bring cases against um, against pending m a deals so it would make it harder to consummate transactions um, and uh, they're not doing early termination on HSR right now because they're just so underwater so antitrust is taking longer it is increasingly um, sensitive in transactions um, you know at a minimum, it is taking longer for deals to get done and they are getting more, um, they're getting a, a tighter review as they move forward. And I think that's mm -hmm. gonna be increasingly increasingly the case as things move on. Um, I don't think it's been the case yet that deals haven't gotten done, or at least not many haven't gotten done on the basis of antitrust matters, but we worry that it's coming a little bit. It is clearly more of an issue now than it once was. And I think that will continue. Interesting. And, and as you think about it from the perspective of, um, you know, a corporate buyer, um, are, and as, as you think about them sort of competing against spec buyers and P potentially, um, are there any areas where you see, you know, a corporate buyer having an advantage from a, a legal documentation standpoint versus, you know, a, a spec as an example? I think the advantage, so I think the advantage of the serial acquirer is just synergies, right? Like a SPAC is a financial buyer. And so at the end of the day, they, you know, they may do a great job with the asset, but they're just, they're figuring out what the price tag is, bringing into the public market. They're not essentially changing what it does. A strategic will always have the advantage at the end of the day of they have an entire organization functionally behind them. And so to the extent that the target is looking to 
you know, they have the IP that's going to change the world and they really want the right platform to develop it, a strategic will always be able to come to the table and say, Here, you know, here's what we've already done and here's the resources we're prepared to devote. So they bring a different mm -hmm. mindset to the table. Um, and in terms of legal terms, you know, I don't know that they historically have been historically strategic has been a little bit more risk averse than PE mm -hmm. or financial buyer. Um, but they have often been able to throw a few more dollars at it. They're, they're a little bit less, it, it, this is an overgeneralization, but sometimes they can afford to be a little bit less. Um, they can throw a few more dollars at something because they have the synergies at the end of, to, to sort of make up on the back end. So I think they come, I do think they come with a slightly different perspective. Um, and I think they come sometimes with a little bit more flexibility in what they can bring to the table. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, and so and speaking of which, John, so what, what's been your experience sort of more recently around what you're seeing um, in terms of valuations and, and pricing dynamics out there? Yeah, I, I think it's probably un, not unexpected that it's just a lot of competition for assets, which has really pushed up the valuations. I think Mahir hit on it earlier in his presentation at the beginning of today with kind of where asset prices are and kind of almost being at all-time highs for a lot of industry sectors, and we're seeing that kind of across the board. Um, so I would say valuations have gotten incredibly rich. Really, I think I said the same thing six months ago, and it's, it's only increased in the last six months in terms of that mm -hmm. pressure. And when I take a step back and think about it, I mean, yes, you've got SPACs out there competing, right? They've got a lot of cash in the trust, but also the pipe behind them to go do deals. And they're competing for a lot of transactions to take public. But in addition to that, you've got you know, a significant billions of dollars committed into PE funds that they have to deploy that capital or else they don't get paid, right? I mean, that's their businesses transacting. And you've got a lot of cash sitting on corporate balance sheets today. And, you know, coupling that with pretty inexpensive debt makes it really easy for every person across the M&A life cycle, all the buyer populations, that is, to pay a lot of money. Um, and so they are. And I think you're starting to see that. And what I think is also driving that is, while a lot of assets are coming to market, and there's probably some low quality assets that are coming to market because they see it as a good opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. There's this whole digital transformation that we've seen, at least in tech, because that's where I spend a lot of my time, that's really been accelerated around COVID. And so a lot of companies are saying, how do I need to change or what needs to change for the future? And you know, I think that's also fueling not just the financial aspects, but the strategy of where companies are going with or where they think they need to go. And do they have the right product and the right talent today to go do that? Or do they need to go acquire that? And are they out there buying startups for tech and talent reasons or taking established businesses because it enters them into new markets and gives them new products? Um, we're seeing all of that. And I think that's all leading to, you know, increased pricing pressure. Yeah. So it's, no, it's a great time to be a seller. I think if you're a buyer, it's a real big struggle and you've got to be really, you've got to have a lot of conviction around why you're doing it, right? There's a lot of reasons to go do it today because of the speed to market. Um, a lot of the synergies that Melissa mentioned, I mean, mm -hmm a lot of good reasons to buy assets when they're going to, you know, change the world if they've got that IP or at least change a market, right? Um, but it's just going to be expensive to do. And so you've got to have a lot of conviction behind that just because of where pricing is. Uh, when we were last having this discussion, there was, there was some thought around kind of the portion of assets that are out there that perhaps are somewhat distressed and could be opportunistic from a value perspective versus versus you know, assets of, of high quality that are being in demand and, you know, um, and, and the, the M&A activity behind them is not necessarily COVID driven. Kind of as you, as you think about where things stand now and the activity you've seen most recently, is it, would you say it's more so sort of that second category? Um, I.e. it's, you know, you, you don't necessarily have that dynamic around the stress assets. It's really a large volume of, obviously, you know, a range of quality of assets, but less of a dynamic around um, distressed sales. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, at least in my practice, I haven't come across any real distressed sales. Anybody out there saying, you know, here's a fire sale or we have to get rid of this. This company is mm -hmm. you know, going under, doesn't have a future. It's really, you know, higher quality assets that are out there that, you know, are all accretive to the acquirer normally. Um, that's how they're looking at them. And I think that has brought out, companies that are not what I'd call distressed, but just maybe a little bit lower quality. You know, the growth rate isn't as good. It's still profitable. It's still going up. It just mm -hmm. might not be multiplying in the same levels or 
as some of the other assets, but they think that they're going to command the same valuation, right? They're still good businesses. Um, it's just whether the pricing is right on them. But no, I really have not seen much in the way of distress at all um, over the last six months or really the last year. Yeah. Um, so speaking of pricing, Elon, maybe moving on to you. Um, on the rep and warranty insurance side, uh, there has been a, a more recent dynamic around um, uh, increased uh, pricing, um, you know, for, for premiums. Kind of, uh, what, what is driving that dynamic from from your standpoint? Um, anything you can speak to there? Yeah, sure. No, it's definitely interesting. So, uh, I, I think the pricing has definitely increased on the reps and warranties side. Uh, it's a now a very widely used product. Uh, I think the popularity of it just keeps growing with every year, mm -hmm. and people have realized how useful it is in terms of both making the deal smoother and also reallocating some of that risk. So. Um, I think the pricing was somewhat depressed or sort of not at the level as it, as it should have been a year or so or even two ago. And so it's not surprising to see the pricing go up. But with this additional activity, uh, amount of activity in the market, it's definitely not surprising to see it go up as much as it has. Um, Generally speaking, it's it's up by about 20%. Um, that's what I'm hearing, you know, I'm seeing in the market as well. So whereas before you could easily get premiums um, somewhere between two and a half and three and a half percent of the limit of the coverage, now we're seeing pricing between three and four percent of mm -hmm. limit and some of the more complicated deals are even exceeding the 4% mark, which is sort of unheard of or unseen previously. Um, and so what's driving that, of course, is the increased amount of activity and, um, and, and in the market. Um, and also, you know, claims activity as well. There's been a, a couple of studies that I'm sure if, if folks are uh, watching this market from AIG and Liberty that have come out looking at the claims and um, there's been lar larger claims uh, that have been uh, out on the market and that have been paid, you know, over $20 million claims. Uh, Liberty was talking about paying several of them uh, recently. And so uh, the insurers are just trying to price, price that in. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned previously on the smaller deals, um, you know, the sort of the bottom level of, a, of pricing has gone up as well. Um, there's very little um, patience from the insurer side on sort of the do-it-yourself kind of diligence um, <laughs> that some of the smaller deals perhaps are, are doing, maybe because they're rushed or there's just not enough um, funds to, to, to conduct sort of a, um, a market standard diligence, but there's just really insurers are not really having any of that. Um, <laughs> And so um, they're looking for a good market um, standard diligence. They're looking at uh, diligence from third party advisors. You know, if there are no audited financials of the target, definitely everyone is asking for, you know, quality of earnings from a third party advisor. Mm -hmm. um, it, so, you know, all of the sort of taking together, you know, the volume, the, the um, claims activity, it's, it's, contributing to the rise in the cost of the insurance. And then you also have to look at sort of the wider insurance market, you know, so the reps and warranties is a subset of the insurance market. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these insurers have other lines of business. And so they are seeing price increases on the other lines of business. For example, the DNO has gone sort of through the roof over the last couple of years and, and especially recently. And if you had looked at the SPAC, directors and officers coverage that just quintupled since sun, uh, since the summer. And so mm -hmm. when you look at sort of what the insurers are uh, allocating in terms of their capacity, if they have these sort of more profitable lines of insurance that they're, uh, they could write, they sometimes pull um, resources in that direction or pull, pull their capacity in that direction. And that's driving up the pricing as well on, on the rep side. So it's, you know, it, they're all kind of interconnected there. So it, as a result, I think, you know, the 20% price increase we've been seeing recently, some are predicting additional increases of up to even 10% on top of that. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's gonna go up that drastically from here. 
Um, I, but I think it's definitely not going to go down. So I think we're in into the current pricing uh, for at least the the um, the last the, the rest of the year or even mm -hmm. further down the road. And and as I mentioned, we have you know a good amount of competition still in the market with the larger insurers um, staying in, and then additional entrants, smaller entrants coming in. Um, but that's really I'm not seeing sort of uh, difference in pricing or variation in pricing between the two. What I am seeing though, is the larger insurers are becoming more conservative uh, on how they underwrite deals and how they, uh, the terms that they're providing. Whereas the, the, the newer entrants are maybe a little bit more flexible. Um, so that's sort of a different different dynamic there. But aside from that, um, the pricing really is, is, is probably gonna stay where it is. and may increase, but I'm hoping not by another 10%. <laughs> Very helpful uh, color there. Um, so it sounds like um, th there, there is a prompt for uh, having more buttoned up the diligence around, uh, you know, uh, audited financials, or, and if not quality of earnings reports, third party sort of, uh, you know, uh, reviews of, of diligence documentation. Um, so that's, that's sort of an interesting dynamic that kind of goes into, um, the buyer's requirements for how they conduct diligence. I mean, John and Melissa, would you say that's sort of uh, consistent with what you're seeing in terms of how buyers are, are look, you know, um, thinking about conducting the diligence process and kind of any implications you're seeing on timing or otherwise? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Although it's, it's a funny tension, right? Because I think the insurers are saying, you can't be sloppy and you need to actually show up having done your homework and the acquirers are saying oh my god I gotta go faster I gotta get this done and like I and I don't have anyone to do the work for me so I I absolutely think there's a real tension there but I, I think both of those are are real dynamics yeah I, I absolutely agree it, it's definitely a tension there especially when a lot of buyers want to be seller friendly and that's one of their strategies to winning the deal is look at how easy we are to work with, but oh wait, at the same time, you know, we want R and W insurance and we've got to do all this diligence. I mean, it's always a question that we ask when we're trying to figure out, well, well what do we need to do from a diligence perspective on a, on a transaction is what level? Cause every buyer has a different level and more and more today it's, well, we need to make sure we're doing enough for the rep and warranty insurance. Um, it's either that or, that combined with, you know, we're doing this as a public company type of deal. So there's really nobody to go back after. And so we need to be really sure about the diligence because we don't have somebody to, you know, go strangle after the fact if something happened. Um, and so I'm seeing that as a big uptick in terms of the level of diligence that's being done, or at least being asked to be done. Whether or not they can actually complete it on time is another story. <laughs> so along those lines, um, are you seeing sort of a, a shift in terms of what buyers are looking at as sort of the key metrics for how they evaluate um, uh, targets and how they evaluate sort of the, the quality of a, of a deal? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think it really depends upon why a buyer is buying this business. So there's a lot of transactions that I'll see where there is no metric. Um, it's just tech and talent and, you know, they've got some IP and we've got a platform and we're going to go take that IP and put it into our platform. And so whatever the historical metrics you know, kind of don't matter other than maybe, you know, how many patents or what are the protections around that sort of product or IP. And in other cases where it's maybe more financial buyers, they are very focused on what the unit economics are of that business. So we can always tweak what's in GNA and what's in selling and marketing. Um, but really does this business fundamentally tick when you get down to kind of a contribution level. And so when I think about those sorts of businesses, it's kind of the same things we've always been seeing. There's a lot more focus on, are you profitable at that kind of unit economic level? Um, and that may include kind of the customer acquisition or the CAC, and you maybe think about your lifetime value and your payback there, or your net revenue retention, you know, KPIs like that. Um, they'll be laser focused on, and if you're not kind of at a good point today, it's how are you demonstrating your path to profitability or your path to improving those metrics? So somebody can kind of tangibly see it and get conviction behind a path to the future. You know, I think what I saw a lot of transactions in the past, which it was just unprofitable, let's just throw money at something. And you still see a lot of those, but I think we're seeing less of those from financial buyers and those are more going into kind of tech and talent type of deals. 
I, mm-hmm. I think the other thing that really that gets focused on is people. Um, I think a lot more today, buyers are looking at who am, who's coming across with this transaction. Do I like this team? Do I believe in this team? Do I think this team is credible? Um, and there's a lot more focus on that human element in the deal. Mm-hmm. So we can look at the metrics all day long in Excel, and that's what we do. Um, but there's a lot more focus on that, that people side I'm seeing today. Interesting. Do you, are you seeing um, this concept of, you know, what does the new normal look like, uh, you know, once, uh, once we're, you know, kind of past the, uh, past the hump and, and, you know, into the end of the year and into next year? Um, and based on that, kind of what does that imply in terms of the, the quality of this company and the ability for this company as a target to succeed? Like how much of that thinking around the macro environmental sort of environment plays into uh, the assessment of targets? I think a lot of it does because I think the companies can only control so much of their own destiny with what, with what they can control, right? There's a lot of macro focus um, facing on it. And as I kind of mentioned a little earlier, you've got this acceleration of that digital transformation that we're seeing. And so a lot of companies are kind of banking on, well, how much of this continues? How much of this has already happened? And so I'm kind of now buying into a plateau. And I think there's a lot of thought around that. And every mm-hmm. kind of sub-industry is going to be in a kind of a different place in terms of what happens when, you know, we fast forward six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever it is, and we're in the new normal. And if you can tell me what that looks like, I'd love to know. <laughs> I'm equally curious. Um, great. So then I mean, one, I guess uh, this one's more for, for the group. Um, and, and maybe, Melissa, we can, we can start with you. But, you know, I think there's been obviously reference made to VC and private equity, um, buyers throughout and 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 they 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 have played a consistently you know consistent large role in terms of the competition for m a um how have you seen you know vcnp more recently affecting the m a market yeah no i mean i think pe is continuing to move the needle in terms of their reputation which is well deserved as sort of disciplined financial buyers who have a pretty high appetite for risk um they use rep and warranty insurance and so i think um, I think strategics have had to sort of, uh, you know, move forward to contend with that and to be competitive with that. The, the, the PE money universe overlaps with the SPAC money universe. And so they're, you know, the, 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 the same dollars are kind of moving into both of those buckets. Um, and then I think from the VC perspective, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I mean, I think you have a fair number of VCs who are sitting in companies that have been private for an incredibly long time. Um, and, you know, they have money to invest, so they, they, they want things to move. Um, you know, there, there hasn't been a particularly active public market for quite a while before this latest boom. So they're kind of eager to get out and get good returns in their portfolio. And then they're also looking to reinvest in kind of what is the next generation. So I think they're, um, you know, I think they're sitting in a couple of different perspectives, depending on if they're already invested in the company or they're looking to invest in something moving forward. And so they're, mm-hmm. they're you know, kind of depending, they can wear different hats depending on where they are in the, in the life cycle. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, John, Yelena, any, any different thoughts there on the, on the P slash VC impact? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that Melissa just said. I think that's a that's a dynamic that we're seeing. I, I think one of the other elements that I'm seeing when I look at my growth equity, so a little bit outside of full acquisition, we're staying more in kind of the minority investment, non-controlling positions, is I'm seeing a, a merging of both the PE and the VC field. I mean, you've got more and more VCs that are going later in stage. They've got these multi-stage, late-stage funds that they're launching to compete um, later in the process, one, because companies are staying private longer, right? If you don't have the public exit, they need to kind of continue to keep their, their position in the business. But at the same time, you've got more PE that are saying, I'm going to go be a growth investor. And so those series DE, I'm going to come down and instead of buying the whole company, I'm going to go take 10% for you know, 200 million or something or whatever it is. And so you're seeing a convergence there, which is really interesting with, um, I'll say it's sellers, but it's really folks that are investing and raising capital, being able to pick between VC and PE much more so than they ever were before, which is a really weird mm-hmm. dynamic. Yeah. 
And I'm seeing, I guess, on the PE side, um, deals definitely are a lot more frenzied than they used to be. I think we talked about this before, but it's especially okay. true of, uh, for PE-driven deals. It just seems to be go, 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 stop, wait, and then go again. <laughs> really, it's, it's yeah, frenzied is a good word, I guess, I guess to describe, describe that activity. Uh, but to Melissa's point, where I'm also seeing a lot more, um, you know, focus, um, you know, PE-backed SPAC deals are happening a lot more. And mm -hmm. then on, in terms of, you know, this competition in the market, as, as it was mentioned earlier, PE firms have adopted reps and warranties insurance and have been using it for such a long time. The strategic clients that we have, um, you know, they're pushing into that space. And so they're creating a lot more competition now for private equity firms. They are now become a lot, becoming a lot more comfortable with the reps uh, and warranties product. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just a lot of competition from all sort of sides of the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll pause for a second in our, in our discussion, um, just to um, uh, remind the audience that there is a Q&A function um, at the bottom of the screen, which will become open. Please do submit your questions uh, for, for the next stage of our discussion. Um, but just moving along uh, in, in, in our conversation here, um, well, is it relates to sort of more on the early stage side of the companies? Um, you know, are there any sort of more unique dynamics uh, that you're seeing um, um, as it relates to early stage companies and their ability to get to get um, to transact here um, in the current environment? Um, and maybe John, we can start with you on that one. Yeah, I don't know that the it's all that much different um, from what I'm seeing in terms of the early stage. It's it's just the kind of continued competition that I kind of mentioned a little earlier here that I'm seeing unfold in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, but, I'll say from yeah. my perspective, I think it's, and, and John hit on this earlier, but trying to value an early stage asset is incredibly hard. I, I, I have, Pers anecdotally, personally, in the last six months, I've seen more deals blow up over valuation before you get to an LOI than I have in mm. honestly the rest of my career. And <laughs> I had a company the other day who came to me and their, their range of price was 10 million to 290 million. And I was like, that can't, like, what is the metric that you're using? Like, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think it's because you're dealing with early, you know, you're dealing with competition and you're dealing with early stage assets. And those are, um, those are such a wild card. It's just, it's really difficult to, to figure out how to think about them. Yeah, and, and similar here on the insurance side as well. I mean, insurers are not specifically against early stage uh, companies, but again, the fact that there's just so much activity in the market for other types of deals, more established companies, um, mm -hmm. perhaps the early stage ones are not getting as much of interest. Um, and also once they actually do get the interest that they uh, need to move forward on the insurance side, um, you know, it's, it's, they better have a really good uh, story around valuation. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and it better be convincing uh, because the, that's going to be a lot of questions um, from the insurer come, uh, around that, you know, how, how they came up with the valuation that they have. And um, again, back to diligence. I mean, it's it, skimping on diligence never pays. <laughs> so for the early <laughs> stage folks, like for anyone else, um, you know, you need to really spend some time on that uh, because down the line, that that's that's gonna kind of come back and bite you. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Um, so maybe turning to sort of the the onto the fun part of uh, speculating about the future, uh, which we all like doing. Um, what, what is uh, your thought around, you know, where you see um, the M&A market, market going um, through, the, through the rest of this year? Um, you know, are we gonna continue to see the same kind of frenzied pace? Are we gonna continue to see, um, you know, the, the level of spec activity we've been seeing? Do things sort of, uh, you know, plateau or, or uh, decline at some point as, as folks sort of get, get over the current hump. Um, what is your sense? Maybe starting with, uh, with John. 
I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, and I wish I could say that I would see this slowing as from a market perspective. I just don't know that I do. I, I think that the things that we've been at for the last six or so months is probably can't continue. Um, but I don't know how quickly that pace comes off. Um, I'm sure it starts ticking down quarter by quarter here, but I, I just don't know that it's going to be that steep of a drop off. And so I think we're going to be incredibly busy for the next year, maybe more from an M&A standpoint as we work through this, mm. unless there's some other large shock to the system. But um, mm. I'm planning not to get a lot more sleep for the next year or so. I wish, <laughs> I wish, it, was the other, I wish it was the other way, though. I, I keep telling my colleagues that we're going to rest next year. <laughs> That's where we are at this point. But I, I think I, I kind of agree with John. I think if we keep going at the same pace, on one hand, I think everyone is just going to throw their hats in and by summer just all collectively take vacation <laughs> um, or or, um, or we're just going to continue at the same pace. I'm not seeing it slow down in any way. It's, you know, from all sides of the market, it's just con it's going to continue going. Um, the question is if we can all survive this kind of pace for a prolonged <laughs> period of time. Um, but I think, again, it's all just going to be, it, what's interesting for me to watch is the competition that's coming from all parts of the market and for mm -hmm. the sellers who are, or the targets who are, you know, doing the dual triple track uh, kinds of uh, exit um, strategies where, you know, they're considering SPAC IPO, a traditional IPO, an M&A activity of some kind. Um, it, it's going to be really interesting to watch how all of this plays out down the road um but definitely i'm not seeing any any uh, any diminishing m a activity in the next few months <laughs> i was trying to describe to my husband sort of the current frothiness in the market and i was like you know it really reminds me of the beginning of the pandemic when we were all rushing to the store to get the toilet paper and there wasn't enough toilet paper there and we were all <laughs> in the lines and paying a hundred thousand dollars for toilet paper on ebay and honestly like this level of pace and anxiety feels a little bit similar to that but but i think and no disrespect to target companies in the, in the analogy um but but i but i think there's a little bit of learning there too and sort of the underlying economics like they're still creating toilet paper. There's still a need for toilet paper. Like m and will always be there. There will always be this level. I think this, on, like, honestly, I hope this level of frothiness calms down a little bit, um, but I don't think the under, there are a bunch of great companies out there. There are a million extraordinary entrepreneurs every day creating great new ideas. That's not stopping. Um, and m and tends to be frequent result of that creation. So I don't think the fundamentals are really going to change. And I think this pace will, again, I personally hope this pace backs off a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I don't see, I, I don't see, you know, the whole market stopping either. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking you might draw a comparison to the residential housing market currently, but perhaps even that would not do the do it justice. <laughs> so the, the run on toilet paper seems appropriate. Um, great, well, um, maybe we will uh, close it out uh, now and, and, um, and just with some sort of last parting words before we move on to Q&A, um, just some last words for the audience and piece of advice as, 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 you, as you think about kind of uh, acquires and how they should approach um, the market. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go first. I, I think the most important thing is stick to the fundamental, T take a deep breath, stick to the fundamentals, figure out, we've all said this, but figure out why you're buying an asset, really understand what it is that you're buying. Um, and, you know, and, and that will always serve you well. Yeah, I think those are really good points. It's don't be afraid of the competition and the frothiness of the market from a valuation perspective, if there are really good underlying fundamentals for why you should do this deal and what it accelerates for your business in terms of whether that's product, customer, route to market, whatever it is, it can be accretive at a lot of different prices because that's exactly what acquirers are underwriting and doing today. So don't let that scare you, but have conviction. Um, you're not going to go after every potential target, 
you've got to go after the ones that are really going to be meaningful and move the needle for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really well said. And then also on the competition point, I would say you need to be aware of the competition around you. Uh, because there are a lot of uh, different competitors coming at that same target from different angles. So it's really important, I would say, to understand the methods and the tactics that those competitors, like the private equity or strategic buyers mm -hmm. or the SPACs are using to get at the target. And maybe even more importantly, not using, like if they're not mm -hmm. using specific methods that or competitive tools that you are in your pocket, like a reps and warranties policy or knowledge of how to run a reps and warranties uh, policy through your deal. And so I think it's important to be sort of aware of that competition around you. And of course, you know, the last thing I would say is, you know, look at your diligence, make sure, <laughs> make sure you, you do the diligence and you do it well, and uh, uh, it, it will only serve you well down the road. Wonderful. Elan, uh, Melissa, and John, thank you so much. A lot of wonderful insights here. Um, with that, we'll move on to uh, Q&A within the rest of the time that we have remaining here. Um, I think one of the, the first questions that has come up on the on the chat is around um, targets that have PPP loans out um, and kind of what are the risks um, associated with, with uh, approaching a target with a PPP loan? Sure, I bring that up really early in the process. Um, those are tricky. There are acquirers who won't take the reputational risk of taking on a PPP loan and so they'll treat it as debt and deduct it even if it otherwise would be forgivable. Um, there are mechanisms where you can park it in an escrow and kind of pay it off over time, but there are often different expectations on the target side and the buy side around how those economics should work out. And I think that is a critical conversation to have very, very early in the process and understand it's another level of complexity you'll have to work through. Yeah. And I'd say on the um, insurance side, PPP loans are excluded across the board from coverage. Mm -hmm. um, from a reps and warranties policy perspective, but there are specific uh, policies out there in the market to cover PPP loans. So if you are interested in those, um, definitely something to, to take a look at. Great. Um, another question that we had pre-submitted um, was really around uh, looking at Equifier situation. So companies where you're primarily hiring to get the talent. Um, you know, how do you structure those deals? Well, how, how do you sort of structure them to uh, arrive at um, uh, sort of mitigating the risk around what it is that you're really focused on, which is the talent? Do you look at sort of non-competes, milestone-based payments, other transaction components that you, you would look at there to uh, for those specific types of transactions? Yeah, I, you can look at all of them. I, I know that for... For the kind of aqua hires, what I'll oftentimes see in my clients is a tension between the deal team and the business unit that wants to make the acquisition. And so oftentimes it's a little bit of internal politics that have to get sorted out there because you'll have the deal team that'll say, we got to get this deal over the hump. They, the seller wants as much money up front as possible because it de-risks them. And the business unit will sit there and say, well, I want to keep these people around. So I need to, I need something, some teeth to keep them around, whether that's retention, milestone payments, something else. And then to throw into the mix, you'll get uh, the accounting folks and they'll say, well, one gets you kind of upfront treatment of um, how it looks on my books. And the other is ongoing um, expense on my books that if I'm a public company, maybe I don't want that expense hitting my books for the next three years. I'd rather take it all today. And so there's a lot of negotiation internally of solving those. And I actually find that more often than not, it's those internal politics between how does this look from our public reporting? What does the business unit want? And how does the deal team end up negotiating that with the seller? But I've, I've kind of seen everything. I mean, I think more typical is how do we, one, get the IP and make sure that we've got kind of an orderly transition to the knowledge because the reality is in most of those sorts of transactions, even if I've got hooks, retention payments, milestone payments, those folks are gonna leave in a few years. And it's how do I transfer that knowledge and institutionalize that knowledge on buying as quick as possible. Got it. Got and it. I think also from the risk perspective, I just wanna point out that, you know, a lot of the more recent claims or focus or emphasis on claims coming out 
have been on the misclassification of employees. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a real risk that the insurers are really looking at and this exists out in the market. And considering the fact that, you know, tax authorities have been spending a lot of uh, uh, funds on COVID related issues, they are likely to come, uh, come out, come after uh, misclassification and, uh, you know, be a lot more stringent on enforcement. So it's really important to make sure that th those employees you're trying to uh, acquire uh, have been properly classified and, you know, every, and there's underlying documentation behind, you know, 1099s or contractors or mm -hmm. whatever it is, and that you're, um, complying with all of the local uh, um, local law, laws like California, you know, specifically difficult in that respect. <laughs> mm -hmm. Got it. Um, we have another question through the Q&A channel, um, or, um, and this relates, John, to an earlier comment you made around seeing a lot of activity across tech, which is, which is your area of focus. Um, are there specific subsectors within tech that you found to be particularly frothy recently? I mean, how do you pick one is, I, I think, the, <laughs> the answer to that. <laughs> um, we can pick it all, whether you think about it from like an application software and you look at something like, you know, Salesforce, Slack, and the valuations that that started putting on those sorts of companies. I mean, you can't do a deal without talking about cybersecurity, executing a deal, which makes all of the cybersecurity companies incredibly valuable. Everybody wants that talent wants that product, wants that offering in there. And you've then got this whole infrastructure layer kind of sitting behind it, which is how do we power all of this? And so even in the mundane things like data centers, you're seeing a lot of activity there. So it's really across the board, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I guess just uh, touching, um, you know, jumping off of that uh, and maybe beyond tech, I don't know, Melissa, Yelena, are you seeing any other dynamics in terms of sectors that are, you know, getting particular attention right now? My world's so I mean, tech focused, honestly, I don't know that I have an intelligent <laughs> answer for the rest of it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot more activity in the healthcare or, you know, health related sector and mm -hmm. all of the sort of sectors that benefited from COVID, um, people being stuck inside and delivery kind of services, all of those have uh, been getting a lot more attention and are liked <laughs> um, <laughs> because obviously they are doing well and have benefited from uh, the the current market environment. Um, you know, healthcare related is one of them, but you know th there are obviously others. Um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think we have uh, enough time for one additional question. We had one come through the, the channel just now around cross-border M&A. Um, so I'm, I'm glad this one came through. I think we haven't, we haven't touched on international. Um, so curious to get your thought around kind of, um, uh, you know, the question specifically asked around tips for, um, you know, U.S. acquires looking at uh, international companies and any tips you have there, uh, best, best practices. Yeah, I think... Um... I will say sort of in terms of market dynamics, I don't know if anyone has a different answer than I do. I don't know that I've seen those dynamics change so much in the last six months. Um, but in terms of, you know, in terms of tips of navigating it, there are real style differences in terms of how people approach transactions and risk and what are standard terms and what does the process look like. And getting a handle on that early in the process will really benefit, you know, acquirers who are looking at assets that aren't in the U.S. So, you know, you can, you can come to the table and say, you know, I, I, I'm a gorilla and I have my U.S. style deal and you have to fall in line with it, but that doesn't always go over so well. So I think it's really, you know, it's engaging local counsel early in the process. It's really thinking through like what, what are their expectations? What are your expectations? And it's it's sort of double communication and making sure you're on the same page in terms of expectations. That's all incredibly important in all transactions, but I would say it's doubly important when you're looking at international assets. Not to mention like all the, you know, the additional regulatory hurdles and structural right. issues and making sure you can actually make, you know, making sure <laughs> the way you're thinking about it actually works there is also to state the obvious important. Right. I would echo the idea of definitely look into um, hiring local counsel. I, a lot of the times folks don't do that because the um, outside operations 
are perhaps you know minimal or they're mm -hmm. spread out through different locations and they don't want to spend the money on hiring local counsel in each one but um that could really end up badly um so definitely an important piece of advice is yet yeah, look into in, into whether you you're able to do that and and if you are then then definitely go for it yeah, I think the stylistic differences are important, right? I mean, we think about U.S. just from an accounting hat. You've got a lot of folks do completion accounts here where we go to Europe. It's much more of a lockbox style. Like there are just some fundamental differences between the markets, which are purely mechanical. So understanding those. But more broadly, I think it's about thinking through what the future state looks like. If you don't already operate in these geographies, you know, really understanding the people and how you're going to control this business and manage it. Because it's one thing to do a Zoom call when we're all sitting in the same, you know, time zone. It's another thing when folks are dispersed all over the world, and especially something that is as critical as a as an acquisition. Um, it's a little bit different than having, you know, some some folks in remote offices or development centers somewhere, shared services. It's, it's a much different thing to manage that cultural integration, everything else that comes along with it from afar. So understanding that I think is key in order to success. And I think just one other thing that I wanted to add is definitely watch your timing, especially now in terms of getting all those regulatory approvals, because I have, for example, have one deal that's been uh, on the books for months and months and months waiting for you know, like a German regulatory approval for, for, for a matter. And, uh, considering the fact that you know every all the regular regulators have been slowed down by covid it's taking a lot longer than anticipated and is creating a lot of problems so just kind of right now watch the fact that you your deal might get significantly delayed um, just because a lot of the regulators are closed down or operating extremely slowly abroad that, that's interesting, you guys. I, I certainly have, we, we, we've seen that dynamic as well and, and something for, for buyers to be aware of going in. Uh, it's one of those things that you don't realize until you're well into the process um, and, and usually post-signing. Um, well, great. Uh, thank you again, uh, John, Melissa, Elena. Uh, very much appreciate the time here at, um, and wonderful to hear um, all the insights you've provided. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing some of your bite-sided insights and expertise. Um, this is a fun panel and I'm gl glad to get the band back together after six months. Hopefully we can have another similar positive frothy market when we talk in another six. Um, <laughs> so thank you all also on the call for joining us. We hope this was insightful and helpful as you think of M&A uh, for growth, for your, either from the company's perspective or from the corporate perspective. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you guys are interested in meeting with our partners, please take a, a moment to let us know. And our last poll, um, and we really appreciate everybody joining us and especially to all the panelists and to your guys' time and talent and expertise. We know how busy you are. And so promise copies on me when we can meet in person, we're all vaccinated. To all those who joined us on the call today, Thank you so much, and we look forward to following up and helping you and welcoming you back to our platform soon. Thank you again, John, Elena, Melissa, Saran. It's great to have you guys back. And to Thank all you. of you. Pleasure. Pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you all online soon. Bye, everybody.